So I'm going to talk to you about a project um, that we're currently working on. It's a team of Berkeley and uh, Stockholm Uppsala researchers. And broadly speaking, uh, uh, the topic is um, the worldwide rise of the radical right. I guess that's why we're here, uh, as Joachim said. Uh, it's a pronounced political phenomenon across countries, across electoral systems, and uh, particularly in Europe, uh, we see uh, radical right parties participating in government in a number of countries, um, but uh, one, where one would have to include the US, maybe some would like to include factions at least of the Republican Party, and perhaps factions of the Tories as well these days. Um, the political programs of, um, of uh, these politicians and these parties uh, tend to glorify past times, things were better before. Um, they embody a strong anti-establishment message, which, ma which makes them populist. And uh, it, they also, when it comes to the radical right, uh, entail a strong anti-immigration message. So that's the broad topic. The more narrow topic uh, today is going to be a case study of uh, Sweden's uh, radical right party, known as the Sweden Democrats. So we're going to ask who are the politicians and who are the voters uh, of this party. And I'm going to look, for data reasons, at the party's period of most rapid growth. So in 2006, this was a relatively small party, then they doubled to the 2010 election, and then they doubled again to the 2014 elections, and our data will stop there. So we'll look at the period before the big European refugee crisis, which is often attributed to these uh, parties. But in the last election, they obtained 17.5% of the common vote. So the basic idea for the project is to sort of start from the perhaps obvious thing that um, people who sympathize with parties like the Sweden Democrats tend to be low status people in society, at least that's one hypothesis. So we'll categorize the population into relative winners and lo losers. So I'll focus on labor market outcomes. So that means income and jobs. Um, and uh, given the period of, that we're investigating and the party's rapid rise, I'm going to zoom in the two most important and dramatic economic events in 2006 to 2014. And that will be a set of uh, government reforms, uh, known in Sweden as the make work pay reforms, which dramatically um, increased the gap of income between outsiders and insiders to the labor market. You will see this soon. The second event is going to be the financial crisis, which uh, dramatically uh, increased the gap in job loss risk between those insiders that are vulnerable and those that are more secure, in the, depending on what occupations they have. And then, uh, I will also look at social outcomes, uh, people who are mar marginalized in the social dimension, so uh, contrast people who live together, uh, married or partnered with others, and I look at people who have children and who do not have children, so further from the sort of establishment of society. So that's the, the key idea. When it comes to the politicians, um, the question then is who become a radical right politician, who become a Sweden Democrat politician. And I say we know very little, uh, if maybe nothing is a better description, systematic about this issue. It hasn't been uh, subject to much research. So we are going to do some very basic things. We are going to compare individual politicians to the population, and we're going to contrast the politicians of the radical right with the politicians of the more established uh, other parties. And we're going to find 
that the Sweden Democrats dramatically overrepresent the losers, while the other parties overrepresent the winners in the way I will define them. And that will be even more true in groups that lost the most during the period of Sweden Democrat growth, i.e. 2006 to 2014. And these results extend, so they become stronger as we start disaggregating into subgroups or into smaller units that, than the nation as a whole. Then we're going to look at the voters. Um, uh, so who are the people who vote for the radical right? And here we cannot claim any originality. There are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of, of such studies already. Uh, but the interest here is to make the comparison between the voters and the politicians, and that's what I'll, I'll focus on. So even though the Swedish data is great, we cannot observe individual votes. So we are going to look at places where the Sweden Democrats attract many votes. So this would be precincts or municipalities. And we'll find that on average, uh, the party is strong in those places where there are many losers. And we will find that they grow the most where the losses were the largest in 2006 to 2014. And these results extend. If you look at individual party sympathies in sur surveys, they tell the same story. So comparing the, uh, the, the results for the politicians and the voters, it looks like they are part of the same kind of citizen candidate movement. That's jargon from, from academia, but if you don't uh, know it, it doesn't matter because the, the label gives, gives it away. So the Sweden Democrat politicians turn out to overrepresent the same groups as their voters come from. And as we will see, this is not only uh, descriptive representation in terms of labor market status, it's also substantive representation in that politicians and voters of the party share the same attitudes. And then towards the end, I'll speculate a little bit about the implications of this for political selection, how well democracy works, but let's wait with that. So here is the uh, precise roadmap for my talk. Uh, since this is a very data-intensive project, I have to tell you a little bit about the data that we're using. Then we'll go to the politicians, to the voters, speak about the conjoint results under the heading of drivers, and then discuss the implications. So, um, we are exploiting Swedish data in different registers. So, we go to the election authority, and uh, there we find um, all politicians who has ever been on a ballot in any election uh, in any election year since 1982. So we link this data to very detailed income and socioeconomic information for the whole uh, grown-up population over 35 years. So this comes from various registers of Statistics Sweden. So I guess people like to talk about big data uh, these days. I guess this is big data. Uh, it's about 14 million unique in individuals, many of whom we observe for 35 consecutive years. And out of these 14 million, about 200,000 are politicians, uh, or a little more than 200,000. So we have a pretty large sample to look at. I guess it's the population, not the sample. Um, and we're going to complement that uh, at times with data from individual surveys. So we're going to rely on uh, a set of representative samples of voters from 1995, and we have our own uh, survey of all local politicians in 2017. So as further background, let me introduce this distinction between insiders and outsiders. And it's not going to be our own definition, someone else's definition. I can go into it in question time if you like. But basically, an insider is someone who has, has had a stable job for a number of years. An outsider has a more loose relation to the, to the labor market. This graph uh, shows you the disposable income of insiders, uh, that's the dashed line, and of outsiders, that's the um, that's the 
solid line. And uh, I marked the year 2006, where a new center-right government rose to power on a program of making work pay. So how did they make work pay? Well, they lowered the taxes uh, for working people, earned income tax credit for each of five consecutive years. And this was largely financed by cuts in social, various social security benefits and unemployment benefits, uh, sickness benefits, etc. And as you can see, in a mere six years, from 2006 to, to 2012, the gap of disposable income between insiders and outsiders grew dramatically. The average number is 20%, which is a large number by, by, by any measure. And as you can see to the, to the right, uh, this differs we, uh, depending on what kind of outsiders we're talking about. We can sort of classify people according to where they get the, their main, um, main income from, even though they don't have a, have a stable uh, employment income. And as you can see, some groups, such as the early retired, uh, had their income relative to insiders fall by 22% and the unemployed or economically active had it fall by 25%. Here is the, the other dis dis distinction in the economic dimension that I want to make, namely between vulnerable and secure job holders. So now we're talking about people who do have stable jobs. Uh, and this is not, again, our definition. It's someone else's definition, including David Dorn, who is sitting in the audience. So we're looking at the occupations of people and whether you have an occupation that is more exposed to job loss than others. And uh, you can see here the unemployment risk uh, of the vulnerable insiders uh, versus the secure insiders. It's sort of always above. But then in 2008, when the financial crisis strikes, uh, the uh, security insiders, they sit comfortably at 4% unemployment, whereas the vulnerable insiders go up to 8, 10, and stay up uh, for a while. So the job loss risk really dramatically changed between these two groups uh, in this recession. So now let us look at the, the politicians. Again, the question is, who becomes a Sweden Democrat politician? So I'm going to look at um, preponderantly the elected politicians in the 290 municipalities in Sweden. You may think, why should I worry about these local politicians? Maybe they just decide on trash collection and, uh, you know, it's not uh, very important. But municipalities in Sweden, um, as cantons in Switzerland, uh, are very important. They are about 20% of the economy, whether you look at it from the spending side, uh, from the employment side, or from, you know, the income tax that they use to finance their, uh, their activities. I should also mention that uh, being a, a local politician like this is a spare time mission. There are a couple of people who are full-time employees of the municipality, but the rest of the people have you know, their own jobs and they take an afternoon off to go to the council meeting in every week. So we have uh, 51,000 um, roughly such politicians who serve in the electoral periods from 2002 to 2014, which is the period we're interested in because of the Sweden Democrat growth during that period. And I should also mention, given the interpretation that I will offer, that on a Swedish party ballot, after each name, it also lists the, the age uh, of the candidate, the occupation, and the residence uh, of the candidate, so people can figure out the composition of of candidates on each party's uh, ballot, just by looking at it. So let me now show you the first, uh, the, uh, the third picture, uh, comparing two party groups with the population. So the elected for the Sweden Democrats and the elected for all other parties. So take a look at um, the, the picture to the, 
to the left, or the part of the picture to the left. So the, 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 um, the leftmost bar is the entire population, so it sums to 100%. I've divided it into the outsiders, as we discussed, into the vulnerable insiders, the secure insiders, the retired insiders, and students who are hard to classify in this dimension. And as you can see, uh, the outsiders and the vulnerable insiders make up about 50% of the population, and uh, the secure insiders about 25% of the population. Now, next, we have the Sweden Democrats. And as you can see, they are overrepresenting uh, the outsiders, they are overrepresenting the vulnerable insiders. So rather than 50% of the population, we're talking now about 60%. And to the right, uh, we have the other parties who instead are, you know, composed of candidates that are 50% secure insiders and they are underrepresenting uh, the losing groups uh, very dramatically. And uh, you may think that this is just conservative parties, but if you look at the left, uh, the Social Democrats and the former Communist Party, they look as bad as the others in this uh, uh, dimension. Now, here is the, here is the, the social uh, side of things. So, uh, here are the people who are single, have no children. It's about 30% of the population. Those that are single and have children. Uh, so altogether about 50%, and the partnered without children, the partnered with children. Sweden Democrats again overrepresent the marginalized groups, uh, and the other parties very dramatically uh, overrepresent the conventional families that partnered uh, with children. And, of course, these things are not independent from each other, so this, uh, these bars here look at what happens if you take the covariation into account. But let me leave that for, for a minute. So, in summary, the Sweden Democrats overrepresent the outsiders, the vulnerable insiders and singles, and the other parties overrepresent the insiders, the secure insiders and the partnered people. This is what happens over time. Uh, so, uh, there's some changes in the population. What happens with the Sweden Democrat elected politicians? Well, they seem to be here replacing some of the insiders with vulnerable, uh, uh, some of the outsiders with vulnerable insiders. And note that this is the period of the financial crisis when these people are exposed to job loss, as I uh, showed you uh, earlier in the, in the aggregate. Whereas if you look at the composition of the other parties, they don't seem to uh, react much. It's pretty much a constant over time. Now let me disaggregate the picture a little bit. So how does the representation look in subgroups? So I'm going to show you measures of the over-representation of certain groups uh, in the Sweden Democrats relative to the other parties. And I'm going to order these subgroups by the size of the income loss that they incurred in the period when the Sweden Democrats grew during this make-work-pay reforms. So uh, I've ordered them according to that, those numbers that you saw in the first diagram on the insider-outsider uh, incomes. And as you can see, the, the Sweden Democrats very much overrepresent the groups, two groups that took the largest hit in, during the 2006 2014, namely the early retired and the unemployed or the economically inactive. And the number on the vertical scale here, about six or five, it means that there are six times as many. Uh, early retired in the Sweden Democrat uh, um, delegation as in the other party delegation. So it's a no small uh, overrepresentation. So it looks as if the groups that are hit the hardest are most engaged in politics. Uh, as, as a result, one is sort of tempted to say, but of course I cannot prove, prove that. But 
the, it's the description. This picture shows you what happens when you disaggregate things uh, geographically. So on the horizontal axis, I measure the share of outsiders in the municipal population. These are, are aggregates of municipalities, just to make the, the figure easier to read. And as you can see in different um, municipalities, it, they range from 25% to about 47% in the share of outsiders in the population. On the vertical axis, I have the share of outsiders in the, among the elected politicians. And the triangles here represent the parties other than the Sweden Democrats. Uh, this is the 45 degree line. Uh, it's not the 45 degree line because the, the, the diagram is a bit asymmetric. But if the two kept pace, this, you will move along this line. And the other parties do not move along this line. They do respond a little bit uh, when the share of outsiders uh, in the population goes up. But you know, the slope is smaller here, so they don't respond uh, proportionately. Whereas the Sweden Democrats, as we already know, always overrepresent the outsiders relative to the other parties. And as the share of outsiders goes up, they respond more vigorously with a larger share of outsiders among their politicians. And if you look instead at the share of vulnerable insiders, the people who took the hit of job loss during the recession, and if you look at singles and do the same exercise, you get the same result. Right? So now let me turn to the voters, which is, uh, as I said, a bit less original, but I guess this, this um, classification of the population is... is uh, following what I just did for the, for the politicians. And we, we will see that the results kind of echo uh, the results that we find for the politicians. So here what we do is that we start from the individual data in the population registers, and then we aggregate uh, up to the precinct or the municipality. The precinct is the smallest unit in which we can measure things. So Sweden has about 6,000 precincts, so each precinct is about 1,200 people on average. And the municipality is this larger administrative unit. And we'll find that the Sweden Democrats are strong in precisely those precincts and the municipalities where there are many losers. And if we look at Sweden Democrat growth, uh, during 2006 to 2014, we find that the Sweden Democrat vote share grew more where the economic losses were the largest during that period. Of course, there can be some omitted factors that drive these correlations, but then we try every page in the book, meaning uh, you know, that those hundreds and hundreds of studies who have identified drivers of radical right voting, and whatever variables that we try, we still find the same results. So I think these are the most convincing pictures. So this is, illustrates how the Sweden Democrat vote share co-varies with some measures of, of losses or, or losers within a municipality. Okay, so we are taking out the municipal mean, both of the Sweden Democrat vote share and of the measure of, uh, of, uh, of losses. Uh, and uh, just look at the precinct variation within that municipality. And as you can see, uh, there is a positive slope here uh, when we look at inequality. Similarly, when we look at the share of vulnerable insiders, there's a pretty drastic uh, positive uh, covariation. We look at the share of singles, and we look at the share of single outsiders. It's hard not to be impressed by, uh, by these positive relations. Now, we can also look at what happens over time. Again, this is within municipality across precinct variation. So this is for the year 2002, for the economic measures, inequality, and the share of vulnerable insiders. And there's not too much of a relation. But at this point, you know, the Sweden Democrats are not a factor. 
and the economic crisis and these reforms have not hit yet. We go over time to 2006, and in particular to 2010, you see uh, that this, this relation becomes much stronger, which sort of suggests, at least, at least to me, that you know, the, the, the event that I spoke about has a big role in what we're observing. You can do this uh, by municip municipality rather than precinct, so a larger unit. And here I'm just showing you the, the growth in Sweden Democrat support related to the growth in inequality uh, over the time period or to the share of vulnerable insiders at the beginning of the recession. And there you see a, a positive uh, relation again. When you look at the average share of singles, you don't see much, but there were no major social sh shocks to the, to the marriage market over this period, uh, unlike for the, for the, you know, the economic uh, side of things. This shows you a map uh, of Sweden. Uh, you're not supposed to, to get much out of this. Uh, I guess the, the left map shows you where the, the, the growth of the radical right was the, was the largest. And you don't know much about Swedish geography, but I guess you can see that the neighbors to Denmark and the neighbors to Norway up there are not very reliable areas. And so that's where you see the biggest, uh, biggest growth here. Uh, and uh, in the two other maps, uh, I've drawn the, the share of vulnerable insiders, those who are subject to more job loss, and the growth of inequality over the period. And what you see is that, you know, there is a sort of, to the eye, there is a bit of a correlation. But the most important part of this map is showing you that is, this is not just a regional dummy, that there are certain regions that dominate. It's a patchwork of, of strong and uh, small things that are distributed all over the country. So what we're picking up is genuine uh, sort of co-variation at the municipal level rather than at the regional level. So, as I said, these results are statistically robust. So this relation between the Sweden Democrat gains and the economic losses hold up if we do things like removing the immigrant vote. Sweden is a big immigrant country like, like Switzerland. If we use only the national inequality shifts rather than the local inequality shifts, uh, which are arguably more given to the, a given region or precinct. It holds if you study different levels of elections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as I mentioned, we also hold constant the conspicuous uh, drivers from research on the radical right, so local immigration, globalization as manif manifested in occupation and in industries locally, local crime, education, political context, uh, nothing kills the, result, the, the relations that I've shown you. Perhaps interestingly, uh, for, for those who know about the contact hypothesis, uh, um, local immigration does not seem to be a significant driver of Sweden Democrat growth. Uh, and we are trying a dozen different measures of local immigration. We look at uh, you know, the level of, immi uh, of immigrants, the res recent changes in immigrants, uh, the labor market impacts, of immigration on jobs or on industries. Uh, we look at media coverage of immigration. Whatever we try, we don't find uh, a, a strong relation uh, and not even a positive relation. So um, let me try and interpret this. So how do we find, think about these joint findings for politicians and for voters? Well, to us, uh, the Sweden Democrat politicians look like citizen candidates. When the, the competing hypothesis was, could be that there is a bunch of people who look to be, become politicians, they have tried in other parties, they failed, and now they see their chance and they engage in this new party and they become representatives for them. So, but if you look at the Sweden Democrat politicians, they are new entrants. So, in fact, only 2% of them were ever elected for another party, and only 9% uh, were ever on the ballot for another party. 
And if you compare that to the established parties, these numbers are much lower. So these are new entrants of politicians. So the other side of the citizen candidate movement is that, you know, the, the idea is that people who share the same labor market status or social status as you, you're a more credible candidate because you find yourself in the same situation and therefore people are more prone to vote for, uh, for, for the party when they run such candidates. But that's what is known as, uh, as descriptive representation. People look the same. Do they also think the same? So is there substantive representation as well? Uh, so do Sweden Democrat politicians and voters share the same views? And here I'm going to rely on, um, on survey data. So I'm going to look at two conspicuous uh, questions, uh, which are verbatim the same, posed to, to a representative sample of voters and the full population of local politicians in the same year, namely 2017. That's where we have our politician survey. So I'm asking people in the Sweden Democrats uh, up here and in the other parties, uh, sympathizers or active politicians, whether they think that uh, one should uh, strongly restrict immigration. And for, for the other parties, you know, about 20% of, of, the, of the voters, the sympathizers, think so, of the politicians, 10 to 12%. And, you know, the politicians are more restrained than their voters. For the Sweden Democrats, instead, 80% of the people who sympathize with the uh, uh, Sweden Democrats think that restricting immigration is a good idea, and 90% or 95% of the politicians. So this is a pretty, pretty large difference. And note that the Sweden Democrat politicians are sort of more activist than their voters. Here is a measure of anti-establishment attitudes, distrust in the national parliament. Again, in the other parties, about 20%, uh, a little fewer among the politicians, uh, express distrust in these national political institutions. Of the Sweden Democrats, 60% uh, do so, or 70% among the politicians. And again, the politicians are more anti than the voters on the other side of the 45 degree line. So it's not just descriptive, but substantive representation. And if you look at other things, such as generalized trust in other people, you find the same pattern. Now, um, let me just look a little bit, uh, since I have a few minutes left, on what happened over time with these particular attitudes. So this graph, the, the uppermost graph, shows what happens with these anti-establishment attitudes in the form of distrust in the national parliament over time. And it wasn't that it was increasing over the period of Sweden Democrat growth in Sweden. On the contrary, uh, the share of people who expressed such distrust went down from 37% to 23% uh, in the population at large. But if you disaggregate people into outsiders versus insiders, as we have done in this discussion of winners and losers, uh, then you see that precisely during the time of these make-work reforms, the outsiders uh, start to express a greater distrust uh, in, in national parliament than the insiders do. This is the relative uh, effect here. Not so for the vulnerable and secure insiders. This is a similar exercise um, for anti-immigrant attitudes. Again, this is before the big refugee crisis in 2015. Uh, so, in fact, anti-immigrant attitudes went down from the beginning of the period, uh, or at least was constant over the period, uh, up until 2014 when our investigation stops. And here, we don't see any differential across insiders and outsiders. So what's going on? 
probably this is going on. Uh, we are here looking at declared sympathizers, the, the anti-immigration preferences of declared Sweden Democrat sympathizers. And among people who have moderate anti-immigration or pro-immigration attitudes, you don't see uh, virtually any change in, in the sympathies for Sweden Democrats. But for those with strong anti-immigration preferences, uh, you do see a dramatic increase. That, this is not surprising, but I think that the interpretation of this is that the salience of these issues uh, suddenly became a major factor that made people with anti-immigrant attitudes go with the Sweden Democrats uh, towards the, the end of our investigation period. So why are the losers drawn to the Sweden Democrats? Well, we don't know. I mean, however good our registered data are, we kind of use them to look into the heads of, uh, of people. But it's very plausible that since they are losers in society, at least in a relative sense, they perceive a low or falling status in society. So it's natural to think that this may make them less trusting in existing political elites. They may socially identify with their in-group, other people in the same predicament. And then it's natural to think that you charge some out-groups. Those out-groups could be the establishment or it could be the immigrants. And uh, when the Sweden Democrats present them with a message that, is uh, that blame the losses that they have incurred on the establishment or the immigrants, it's plausible that they get attracted. So I think we're talking about a, a complex mix of economic and social causes. Uh, this idea, maybe we'll hear more about it in future sessions, whether it is you know, is it cultural factors or is it economic factors? It's the wrong question. It's got to be both. It's just a question of trying to fit them together. It's, you know, a stupid question to think it's one or the other. It's like saying it's only nurture or it's only nature that uh, uh, brings persistence across generations. But it, I would say that there is a conspicuous timing of these economic shocks that I emphasized and the Sweden Democrat growth. Uh, that is hard to escape. So, does democracy do its job in, um, uh, in Sweden? I mean, this is, it's hard to escape the fact that the Sweden Democrats gives voice to groups that didn't have much uh, representation, or at least they were seriously underrepresented in the past. So, in some sense, that makes democracy more inclusive. But then, you know, maybe there's another side of that coin. So we are looking at how politicians in, in Sweden, Democrats, and the other parties compare when you start looking at auxiliary traits. This is the last uh, uh, graph that I'll show you. Um, it shows how politician characteristics, various types of abilities, uh, compare across the Sweden Democrats and other party politicians. So f farthest to the left, uh, this just shows that on average, Sweden Democrat politicians have 50% less political experience. Fine, it's a new party, so it's a, it's a natural result. But if you look at to what extent uh, elected uh, candidates have public sector experience, you see the same um, that public sector experience means having worked in the public sector, and since the municipalities are involved with running the public sector, this should be a valuable thing for voters to have, uh, potentially. Uh, so it's 30 percentage points less among the Sweden Democrats compared to the other parties. 25 percentage points less have a university education. Once we look at other measures of abilities, this is a measure of ability from the, from the labor market. The Sweden Democrat politicians are one half standard deviation below uh, the, the other party politicians. This shows the motivation of people. This is from the, from the survey with the local politicians that we have, the so-called Perry score. So, you know, is it private gain or is it public service that drives people's motives to do things in life? Uh, 
Again, the Sweden Democrat politicians are about half a standard deviation below the other party politicians. This is a measure of morality. We like our politicians to have high morals, presumably. Uh, so this is the so-called hexaco scale that measures uh, people's integrity uh, by a number of questions. Uh, and the Sweden Democrat politicians have uh, a quarter standard deviation, uh, worse morals than the other party politicians. So it looks a bit like a, a representation ability trade-off. Um, you know, growth of the Sweden Democrats raised representation of the, these lo losing groups, but they weakened political uh, selection on ability. And uh, this political selection on ability is something that we have highlighted, the same co-authors in earlier work, which basically shows that Sweden works very much like an inclusive meritocracy. And that seems to be uh, now challenged by the rise of the party. So I'm not going to take an normative stance on this. I'm just pointing to the trade-off, and you'll be the judge, or someone else will be the judge, uh, about uh, how you want to think about this. So let me summarize. I have zero minutes left, so I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so we study the Sweden Democrats' politicians and voters. I think we add to earlier findings on how job losses and austerity reforms may help shape the populist vote. We also show that the same factors you know, lead to supply of uh, new politicians in the radical right. More generally, we uncover how the radical right overrepresents lo losing groups among politicians and voters, and we interpret this as a kind of a citizen candidate response, where economic losses, falling trust, and perhaps social identification may interact. So the bottom line is that the populist rise looks like a representation ability trade-off. And then, finally, in the discussions about the radical right, one tends to blame its rise on too much inclusion in policy, in that case, migration policy thinking about these make-work-pay reforms and the austerity that went with them, it seems that the fuel of the rise of the Sweden Democrats in Sweden may have been too little inclusion in policy, in that case, in fiscal policy. So I'll stop there. Thank you.